Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series of webinars with our legal partner, ANL Good Body. The number of members that have been joining us throughout this series has been really encouraging and feedback has been very positive. So we are delighted to be able to continue the series today. For anyone that does want to go back and catch up on our previous ones, they are all available on our website at charteredaccountants.ie forward slash Ulster. Today's webinar is an important update on whistleblowing from Ashleen Byrne. Ashleen, who you pro probably know from previous webinars, is a partner in ANL Good Bodies Employment and Incentives team and has over 20 years experience in advising on employment and equality law. She advises on contentious employment litigation, employment aspects of commercial transactions and procurement. Today, Ashleen will provide a brief overview of whistleblowing, including some top tips for employers and what protections are available for employees. We'll be taking a look at the legislative framework, definitions of key terms, as well as some case studies of recent whistleblowing cases. Please feel free to put your questions for Ashleen into the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. I would ask just that you keep your questions general as Ashley cannot answer specific legal queries during the webinar, but uh, we will have our contact details on screen at the end should you wish to contact her afterwards. So we have a lot to get through and we're ready to start. So Ashley, if uh, you would like to kick off, thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. So um, today I'm gonna take you through uh, workplace whistleblowing primarily and look at some of the key concepts. But when I was thinking just before the session to so the reasons why you all need to be here today, I suppose the first reason is that as responsible employers, you have a moral obligation to deal with whistleblowing complaints. Um, but not only that, the, the reputational damage that you can suffer if you don't take complaints like this seriously can be really significant. And we've probably all seen um, a lot of the Me Too reporting over the last few years and the, the impact that that um, type of incident has had on a business. And then finally, just thinking about ESG, I know it's the buzzword at the moment, um, but whistleblowing certainly fits into the governance side of that. And you've probably seen when you're tendering for contracts, public contracts in particular, the requirement now to include a section on ESG. And again, that reinforces the need to get whistleblowing right. I don't know if you, if you recognize the individuals on the screen. Um, so these are some of perhaps the most high profile whistleblowers that we've seen um, in the last few decades. Uh, the first one um, is Linda Tripp. Um, and I know 1998 has been in the news recently. We've had all of the Good Friday celebrations, which is great. There were other things happening in 1998 and, and Linda Tripp was the person who exposed the Monica Lewinsky um, affair uh, in the White House. Uh, subsequently lost her job in the Pentagon and a lot of her personal information was leaked. Um, she settled her case. Uh, against the US government and I think she got about half a million dollars at the time so again a very high profile whistleblower you'll see Chelsea Manning in the middle of the screen again um, perhaps at the very serious end of the spectrum of when things um, go wrong for a whistleblower a uh, sentence of 35 years in jail um, served seven I think uh, free now but very serious consequences um, for her and then finally e Edward Snowden um, who released information about uh, the US national security and surveillance and is now exiled in Russia. Um, so yeah, you'll see the quote at the bottom of the screen from Barack Obama, you know, the best source of information in relation to fraud and abuse in government is an existing government uh, employee. Uh, all of the individuals on the screen were, were government employees, but this is the really extreme end of the spectrum, I suppose, um, where you'll see um, people either exiled or imprisoned. And thankfully uh, in the UK jurisdiction, that, that hasn't happened. Um, but nonetheless, there've been a number of high profile whistleblowing cases um, including cases involving the financial services um, sector. Um, so you'll see cases um, on the screen, um, the increase in whistleblowing complaints that have been made to the FCA. Um, and for any of, the, any of you that are FCA regulated, you'll probably be aware of the requirements under CISC 18. Um, I'm not going to go into them in any great detail today. Um, and 
they cover what's called reportable concerns. So slightly different um, to whistleblowing complaints from an employment law perspective. We could probably run an entire session on the FCA requirements, but if you have any queries in relation to that, just send me a message um, on LinkedIn and I, and I can pick that up um, after the event. Again, you've probably seen this um, very high profile case with, that was, that's been in the media over the last couple of years locally. Um, and we haven't had too many high profile whistleblowing um, cases in Northern Ireland, but this certainly was one of them um, against the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, and you'll see the claimant on the screen, Tamara Brunkers. Um, when I look at this picture, sometimes I think she looks like a superhero when she she almost looks like she's wearing a superhero cape. Um, but certainly she did a lot to expose animal, animal welfare concerns within the department. Um, she raised issues in relation to traceability um, and, and major supply chain meat issues, which were then ignored by her superiors. So effectively, her whistleblowing complaint wasn't taken seriously. She had almost 20 years service with the government department. Um, she was then sort of ostracized and ignored after she raised the issues. And it culminated in her resignation from the department. Um, she felt that she could no longer continue to work there. Um, a really substantial settlement, 1.25 million. One of the largest settlements for an employment claim in the NI jurisdiction. So again, I suppose that's another reason why we all need to take whistleblowing um, seriously and, and treat, th treat the complaints seriously when, the, when they do arise. So the background to whistleblowing um, is that we've had the legislation in place in the NI jurisdiction and across the UK um, a lot longer than, than other jurisdictions. Um, it's been in force in the UK since 1998. Um, and the reason why the legislation was introduced originally was in the wake of a number of um, very high profile issues such as the, the Piper Alpha disaster, the Zeebrugge ferry disaster, and when inquiries were launched into the likes of, of Bearings Bank, etc. I think there was an acknowledgement that individuals were aware perhaps of issues um, and fraud, um, health and safety concerns, but they didn't feel that they had the protection um, to, to raise the complaints with the employer. Um, so acknowledging that then the government introduced legislation to provide some protection for whistleblowers and some redress for them um, in the event that they're either dismissed or subjected to a detriment on the grounds that they'd raised a complaint. So you'll see the relevant legislation at the bottom of the screen um, and it was updated in, in 2016 and, and we'll come on to look at that a bit later in the session. So what is a, a protected disclosure? Um, well, it, it, it is a disclosure of relevant information. And again, we'll come on to look at what that information needs to cover. Um, it can be made by a worker. So that, that's an important point to bear in mind. The protection doesn't only extend to employees. Um, so if you've got any workers in the organization, they too are entitled to protection um, as whistleblowers. Um, the disclosure needs to be made to the right person and in the right way. And we'll come on to look at the mechanism um, by which disclosures can be raised. Um, it can cover disclosures that arise not only within the, the UK and the NI jurisdiction, but further, further afield. So if you're an organization that operates um, on a European level or globally, and issues are arising in offices and locations outside the UK jurisdiction and somebody, somebody within the, the NI jurisdiction raises an issue in relation to that, they are covered under the whistleblowing legislation. For a disclosure of information to qualify uh, as a qualifying disclosure, um, it needs to be a disclosure of information and, and, that, and that sounds a little bit circuitous and we're going around in a circle, but um, it needs to be something concrete for the employer to be able to investigate. Um, so if it's just a gripe along the lines that uh, I don't think this organization is taking health and safety seriously, that really doesn't give the organization enough information to go on in terms of being able to investigate it further. 
Um, and you'll see the Cavendish Monroe case that dealt with this particular issue um, and, and the tribunal in its comments distinguished between um, a statement, you're not complying with health and safety law, as opposed to the disclosure of information um, and use the example of a, a hospital setting where someone complains that the wards have not been cleaned in two weeks and, and sharps have been left lying around. And you can see the distinction between the, those two types and categories of information. One gives the, the um, employer uh, enough information probably to be able to investigate it. Um, it can include suspicions or allegations. Um, so uh, the person raising the complaint um, doesn't even need to have concrete evidence that something is happening. Um, a suspicion uh, is, is, is enough in many cases. The information must fall into one of the six categories that you'll see on the screen. Um, so it won't be covered as a whistleblowing complaint if it doesn't fall into these categories. Um, perhaps the most common category that we see whistleblowing complaints raised under is breach of a legal obligation. Um, and then sometimes I think uh, a danger to health and safety, and um, particularly in um, the COVID era, um, a number of complaints were raised that would have um, been categorized as, as a health and safety complaint. Um, less likely a, a criminal offense, but it does happen. Um, damage to the environment, increasingly issues are being raised um, in relation to those issues too. So for the complaint to be classified legally as a whistleblowing complaint, it needs to fall into one of the categories that you, you'll see on the screen. A worker must also reasonably uh, believe that they're making the, the complaint uh, in, in the public interest. Um, so um, that was a change that was introduced under the 2016 um, legislation. Um, and uh, it, 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 that legislation dispensed with the good faith requirement. It used to be the case that the complaint had to be raised in good faith. That's no longer a requirement, but good faith is now only relevant um, at, the, at the remedy stage. So in keeping with the, with the name of the legislation, that's the, the public interest um, order, um, the disclosure must be made in, in the public interest. Um, and sometimes it arises that complaints are being raised by individual employees when they have a particular gripe or a grievance um, in, in relation to their own personal circumstances. And it can be difficult then to determine whether that complaint has been raised um, in the public interest. But the Chesterton case is useful in sort of setting out some guidelines in relation to what a court or tribunal will look at uh, when they're trying to determine if the complaint has been raised in the public interest. And as you would expect, they look at the number of individuals who are impacted by the disclosure. So if it only impacts the complainant raising the issue, it's less likely to be a complaint raised in the public interest. Also, the type of interests that are affected, you know, if it's serious health and safety concerns in a factory setting, for example, um, then it's, it's something that's likely to be deemed to be raised in the public interest. Um, the actual wrongdoing that's disclosed, again, the more severe it is, the more likely it, it'll qualify as a protected disclosure. And then finally, the, the identity of, of the wrongdoer. In terms of who in, uh, individuals, uh, employees and workers should raise their complaint with, um, the legislation is set up in such a way that um, the first port of call should be the employer. And I suppose the premise behind that is that a lot of issues can be resolved internally in the workplace uh, if the employer deals with them properly, investigates and tries to resolve the issue. So. The legislation doesn't really envisage people going further afield if the issue can be resolved internally. However, there is scope for uh, workers and employees to make the disclosure more widely to a prescribed person um, where they reasonably believe that the information that they're disclosing is substantially true and that and they're disclosing it to the right entity. So if we take um, uh, businesses that are operating in the financial services sector, the FCA is, is a prescribed body 
under the legislation and you'll see some of the other prescribed persons on, on the screen, as you would expect, uh, the General Medical Council, the GMC, the Health and Safety Executive, Northern Ireland, I've mentioned the FCA, um, also the ICO covering off data protection issues. Um, so it's legitimate for complainants, employees and, and workers to raise complaints with those entities where they believe that the information that they are disclosing is substantially true. And in reality, most individuals raising those types of complaints will believe that the information that they're disclosing is true. Moving on then to wider disclosure, the wider the disclosure, the more difficult it is for individuals to make that disclosure. And again, it's in keeping with the idea under the legislation that the employer really will be the first port of call so that the issues can be resolved internally without going further afield. There is, however, scope for individuals to bypass the employer um, and to go um, to the media, for example, um, where there is an exceptionally serious failure. Um, now, to do that, the individual must still believe that the information that they are disclosing is substantially true. In addition, they must not be making the disclosure for personal gain. And again, um, it's understandable to why that is part of the requirement. And then finally, that it's reasonable in all the circumstances. And in the event that the disclosure is not exceptionally serious, and again, you'll see the conditions on the screen. Um, it becomes more onerous for people um, if, if the disclosure is not exceptionally serious. They have a few more hoops to jump through before they can go and make that disclosure more widely. The whole idea behind the legislation being introduced was that it would afford individuals some protection in the event that they make a qualifying disclosure. Um, and so if we think back to this Zebra uh, ferry disaster that I mentioned at the very beginning, um, it, it's designed to ensure that em employees don't have a fear that if they raise something, they'll be penalized or they will be dismissed. Um, so effectively, workers uh, and employees are protected um, from detriment and also um, from dismissal. So detriment is given a very wide definition. Um, it's, it's an act or a deliberate decision not to act by an employer, but it, it can include a whole myriad of of things um, and the legislation is deliberately not prescriptive because I don't think it would be possible to describe the whole host of detriments that workers and employees could be subjected to if they make it a, a protected disclosure. But typically, uh, when we look at the types of cases that we've seen in the office, it tends to be things like being bypassed for promotion, um, not receiving a, a pay rise, being excluded from invites to social events, um, that type of activity. Um, and again, um, it can be more subtle than that. It can be leaving people out of email chains, um, but detriment will be considered and decided upon um, by the tribunal. Um, but just important to bear in mind uh, as a business, as an employer, that if somebody makes a, a protected disclosure, you just need to be really careful in relation to uh, any action that you take in relation to them um, and ensure that you can distance it from the disclosure that they have made and they can't connect it in any way um, and argue that the treatment that they're being um, subjected to is on the basis that they've made a protected disclosure. In terms of a remedy um, for, for detrimental treatment, it's calculated in a really similar way to a calculation um, it, for injury to feelings uh, in, the, in the event of discrimination. Some of you will, will already be familiar uh, with, with that type of calculation, um, but it's based on what's called the Vento scale and the Vento principles. Um, and uh, the the compensation will be calculated based on severity. So for very low scale detriment, um, it'll be a low band um, starting in around £1,000. At the very extreme end of the scale, um, the maximum is now in around £50,000. So it's a substantial amount of money. Um, you still need to be really careful uh, about detriment um, and tribunals take detriment very seriously, as you see, see from the decision at the bottom of the screen, Virgo Fidelis. 
The other important point to make uh, about uh, remedy is that employers can be vi vicariously liable for the actions um, of their employees. So um, you need to be careful about that. Employers do have a defence in the same way as they would have a defence and discrimination claim if they can show that they took all reasonably practicable steps um, to av avoid uh, the detrimental treatment or, or, or the termination. Um, but um, if, if they can't rely on that defence, uh, then they could be vicariously liable. Um, and a co-worker can argue that they acted um, on the direction of, of an employee or of an employer. So the other protection under the legislation is a protection from unfair dismissal. And an employee will have protection fr from unfair dismissal if they can show um, that the, their treatment was uh, as a result uh, of, or if the principal reason for the dismissal was a result of them making a protected disclosure. Um, and again, many of you will be familiar with the remedies uh, for unfair dismissal, uh, reinstatement, re-engagement or uh, compensation. Now, the interesting thing about compensation for whistleblowing claims is that there's no cap. Um, and again, there's been an increase in the limit for ordinary unfair dismissal recently, uh, and it's now selling at um, just over £105,000 sterling. But um, for uh, whistleblowing complaints, uh, there's no cap. Um, so that's why you'll see sometimes employees who are trying to maximise uh, the awards that they can get from an employer uh, raising a whistleblowing complaint in tandem, perhaps with other complaints such as uh, d discrimination complaints. And the reason for that is that there's no cap on, on the award of compensation. The other interesting point to make about uh, dismissal on the grounds of, of whistleblowing is that there's no service requirement. So in the same way as, as, an, as a discrimination complaint, um, an employee uh, can bring a complaint um, as day one right. So they don't need the ordinary service of one year to bring a, an unfair dismissal complaint on the grounds of whistleblowing. And again, that can be a really advantageous complaint for individuals who don't have the service with an employer. Um, and so sometimes again, you'll see that type of complaint raised, um, particularly where, for example, there's a, a dismissal at the end of probation. There've been issues, an employee may have raised complaints with the employer um, so it can be advantageous for them to bring uh, a whistleblowing complaint for that very reason. I've mentioned the 2016 legislation, which updated the, the legislation that's dated back now to, to 1998. Um, and uh, as I say, uh, it, you know, established the, pump, the public interest uh, test. It also introduced personal liability for detrimental acts uh, or omissions committed by co-workers. Um, and that's important because you will now see um, proceedings issued not only against the employing entity, but also against individuals. And we've seen that for some time uh, in relation to discrimination complaints and claims in tribunal. Um, but now since 2016, individuals can actually name their co-workers um, for, for detrimental acts, and that's important. Important too for employers when they're rolling out whistleblowing training, um, because I think it, it hits home um, for employees within an organization if they know that they can be named and held liable personally uh, for, for acts, detrimental acts that they take against a whistleblower. Um, so if you are going to roll out training in your organization, um, I would highlight that point um, because it, it can certainly reinforce the, the importance of, of the training. I've mentioned the removal of the good faith requirement. Uh, so it used to be the case prior to 2016 that whistleblowing complaints had to be made by the uh, employee or the worker in good faith. Um, that's now been removed, but it is important at remedy stage. So um, I've mentioned the tribunal, if they are looking at making an award of compensation and they believe that the individual hasn't raised the whistleblowing complaint in good faith, they can reduce the compensation awarded by 25%.
So if we just take a very basic um, case study, um, just to see how the, the whistleblowing legislation operates in practice. Um, this scenario on the screen, um, Mary, senior compliance manager in a large accountancy practice, um, there an issue arises, an admin assistant sends an email um, with the wrong attachment. Um, and this type of situation happens all the time um, in, in every organization across the globe. Um, and I think it's important then um, to, to address the issue quickly. It's what you do uh, in response to it. That's, that's very often um, the most important thing. Um, so on Mary's instruction, the assistant email, uh, emailed the recipients and asked them to irretrievably delete the data, which is the sensible thing to do. Mary reports the incident to the data protection officer at Global Head of HR. She's worried about the breach notification requirements to the ICO. Um, and if we think back to the prescribed bodies, the ICO is a prescribed body because they oversee the, the data protection legislation. And there is, of course, a duty to report a data breach to the ICO within 72 hours if it poses a risk to the rights and freedoms of the data subject. So if we think about this particular scenario on the screen, um, there clearly is a risk uh, to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects. We probably need more information in terms of the number of recipients of the email and the file and what the response is uh, to the assistance email etc but there's definitely an issue in relation to a reporting requirement to the ICO. Mary's then ignored um, advised that uh, there's no need to make this report to the ICO um, and that the organization can't cope with the PR fallout or the potential PR fallout of this issue. Um, she's then given a below average performance rating um, at her next appraisal. First question, did she make a protected disclosure? Um, I think the answer to that is probably yes. She made the report to the global head of HR and the DPO. There may be um, a certain tier of management um, articulated in internal policies, um, but uh, even if she hasn't done it through the, the correct channels, this definitely looks like a qualifying disclosure, uh, should have been investigated by the business um, and dealt with. Um, so I think the first answer is yes. Can she bring a claim against her employer? Arguably she can, and her complaint would probably be one of detriment. Um, so if, for example, she received a below average performance rate and it resulted in her not receiving a pay rise, for example, that's a pretty serious consequence for her. And she could bring a, a complaint in the local tribunal arguing that uh, she's been subjected to a detriment. Now, the usual time limits apply um, for individuals when they are bringing a whistleblowing complaint. And again, many of you will be familiar with the time limits in, in the local tribunal. Usually um, employees uh, and workers will have three months from the date of the act within which to bring a claim. So again, important to keep an eye on timescales and, and time limits. Um, the tribunal does have the power to extend time, um, uh, but it's only if it's not reasonably practicable for the individual uh, to bring the complaint. So it's quite a high uh, threshold. Um, so I think the answer to that question is yes, she could probably bring a, a claim against the employer, um, although we'd probably need more information. So looking ahead um, and, and what we need to think about uh, in, in terms of whistleblowing, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that we need to be conscious of potential changes coming down the line, uh, particularly legislative changes. Um, the UK government announced only a couple of weeks ago that they're going to undertake a review of whistleblowing law in the UK. And, and that's been on the agenda now for a couple of years. There have been a few private members bill proposed. Um, there's been a lot of agitation um, from organisations such, such as Protect, um, and they see the need to review the whistleblowing legislation um, to determine whether it continues to be fit for purpose. Um, on a European level, the deadline for implementing the EU whistleblowing directive has now passed. Um, and so other countries within Europe have now updated their legislation. And um, the UK, obviously now not part of uh, Europe, is not obliged to implement 
the the European whistleblowing directive. Um, but it may consider making some changes because it'll be easier to trade within Europe if if our legislation um, sort of follows in, in, in many ways the legislation ac across uh, Europe at a European level. And I suppose from a, a multinational business perspective, um, it, it's a lot easier to operate when you've got uh, similar rules applying um, across the jurisdictions. Um, but at the moment, we haven't implemented the EU whistleblowing directive in the UK. Watch this space for legislation that's coming um, down the line. Um, it's always worth looking at your whistleblowing policies just to uh, reassure yourselves that they continue to be fit for purpose, um, that they, they set out the right tiers of management uh, that individuals need to bring their complaints to. If it actually names people and they, they are no longer with, with, with the organization, um, then obviously they need to be updated. So it's always worth just take, undertaking a desktop review of your policies uh, on an annual basis and, and updating them where necessary. Training is really important. Um, and in terms of you being able to rely on that reasonably practicable steps defense that I mentioned earlier on in the session, um, training will feed into that. So if you have a Maverick employee or a rogue employee who subjects somebody to a detriment um, and you've given them training in relation to whistleblowing obligations, uh, so not only their rights, but also their obligations, that will certainly stand you in good stead if you're on the receiving end of a tribunal claim. Um, so training uh, in all aspects of employment is important, um, but uh, equally in, in relation to whistleblowing, um, I, I would maybe look at annual training or at least refresh your training on, on an annual basis. Promoting awareness is important. Um, having the policies is one thing. Um, but action is, is what's important. So again, um, making the policies accessible, um, making individuals aware of what their rights are under the legislation, making it easy. In, in bigger businesses, sometimes they'll have a whistleblowing hotline um, that make it, make it easy uh, for individuals to raise issues and, and raise complaints. And again, that's all in the spirit of openness transparency feeds into our ESG obligations. Informal resolution uh, is usually the way forward. And again, when we go back to the legislation um, and, and the way it's framed, that employees and, and workers will, will raise the complaints with the employer, first of all. The idea is that uh, in many cases, you'll be able to resolve those issues internally. You'll only be able to do that if you deal with the complaints promptly, efficiently. Uh, and properly. Um, so again, make sure you action them quickly um, because if you let the complaints sit for any length of time, they'll just fester and uh, workers and employees will, will just think that you're not taking their complaints seriously. And then I think finally, if your whistleblowing policy references other policies, um, such as bullying and harassment sometimes, and particularly disciplinary um, procedures, um, again, you need to make sure that they cross-reference the policies um, properly. So I think that that's a whistle-stop tour of, of whistleblowing. Um, I think if anybody has any questions, uh, happy to take them now. Thanks, Ashling. Um, yeah, so if anybody wants uh, to ask Ashling a question, please stick it into the Q&A box. Uh, we have a couple there already, Ashling. Um, first one, can you please provide a definition of a worker? So does it cover directors, shareholders, trustee, volunteer director, etc.? Yeah, um, short answer is it, it possibly can. Um, the worker definition is under the Employment Rights NI order uh, of, of 1996. Um, so for the likes of a shareholder probably isn't going to, to fall into the category uh, of, of worker. Um, but, um, uh, you know, other categories mentioned could. Um, and when we think about the 
EU whistleblowing directive, for example, um, it's actually extended the categories of individuals beyond workers. So it, it actually now covers applicants for employ, uh, employment and volunteers. Um, so um, I think probably rather than get, getting fixated on the definition of worker, if, if a complaint is raised with you and you're in a little bit of doubt as to whether, you know, that they would be protected under the legislation, I think the rule of thumb is always to investigate it anyway. Um, and again, go to the employment rights order if you're in any doubt as to whether they're, you know, they, they fall into the definition of worker or not. Great, thank you. Another one, um, for all Ireland, all Ireland businesses, do they need separate whistleblowing policies for each jurisdiction or can they use just one for, for both operations? Yes, yeah, so that's that's an interesting question now in light of the EU whistleblowing directive, um, because that directive has been implemented in Ireland. Uh, the legislation came into force on the 1st of January 2023. So the jurisdictions are now becoming more divergent in terms of their protections, Quite whilst they're still quite similar um, in, in that the basic premise is the same. As I've mentioned, that the categories of individuals that are now afforded protection under the legislation is broader in, in the Republic of Ireland. So as I mentioned, they've extended the protections to volunteers, applicants for employ, employment, um, shareholders, etc. Uh, and they've also uh, sort of increased the, the penalties. Um, so... Uh, they call it penalisation in the Republic of Ireland as opposed to detriment. So there'll be differences in terms of the terminology used um, and that then might feed into the, the policy wording. Um, I suppose the gold standard would probably be the Republic of Ireland now um, and other jurisdictions that have implemented the EU whistleblowing directive. Um, so um, it may be the case that you will just implement that gold standard and have that applicable across your organisation if you're either an All-Ireland entity or you're a multinational. Um, and again, the, the sanctions in the Republic of Ireland are now greater. You know, there's now a criminal pe penalty um, potentially for penalisation. Um, so it's perhaps more important to get it right in the ROI jurisdiction, albeit it's, it's important to get it right in every jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Um, next question. If a whistleblower makes a disclosure to the wrong body, does the employer have any rights re wrongful disclosure? Yeah. So I suppose going back to uh, the disclosure itself, um, if they make a disclosure to the wrong body, um, it's, it, it's, clearly going to be an issue for the individual in terms of the reporting mechanism under the legislation. But if there is substance to the disclosure that the individual is making, it's still an issue for the employer is what I would say. So uh, if if we go back to the, the actual test and work our way through what the person needs to, to do to make a qualifying disclosure, is it a disclosure of information? If the answer is yes, um, it, does it fall into one of the six categories? If the answer to that is yes, do, uh, is it in the public interest? And if the answer is yes, and if for some reason they make it to the wrong um, body, I think it's still something that the employer will need to take heed of and investigate. Um, so, um, and I suppose the answer will depend on whether they've raised it internally. Sometimes individuals will raise the issue internally and they'll also make the report to the prescribed organisation. Um, so again, without knowing the exact factual circumstances, I think if it's if it's still fall, it still ticks the boxes in relation to the other requirements, it's probably still something that the employer will need to look at. OK, thank you. Um, what ESG considerations should we consider including, for example, greenwashing? Yeah, so, I mean, ESG, as, as everybody knows, it covers environmental, social uh, and governance. Um, so whistleblowing tends to be without, we could, we, could, we could probably run an all day session on ESG because it straddles 
so many different topics. But from a whistleblowing perspective, it's probably more likely to fall into the governance, but also I suppose the social uh, category in, the, in that, it, you know, employers and businesses need to get things right from a social perspective. And then they go, from a governance perspective, they need to make sure that they've got the policies and the procedures in place and that they take the complaints um, seriously. So to go back to the question um, and, and, and greenwashing, um, I think uh, the answer probably will apply in relation to ESG generally, um, and I've mentioned it already. Um, having the procedures in place is, is one thing, but it's actually actioning them, um, increasing awareness, and it goes back to sort of the, the tips um, about um, having a easy mechanisms in place for individuals to raise complaints, um, increasing awareness, um, rolling out training um, and updating your policies. Um, and, and, and that's probably the direction to go in from an ESG perspective. Okay, thank you. And the final, no, it's not the final one. Uh, at what stage would it be fair for the complainant to lose anonymity, for example, at the tribunal stage? Yeah, so um, it, tr tricky because uh, there are there are occasions when an individual will want to remain anonymous, um, and and it's legitimate. Um, it's more difficult in many cases for an employer and a business to investigate complaints from from an anonymous source, um, because sometimes there'll be a question mark over. The legitimacy and the sincerity of the complaint um, and will they have enough information will they be able to get enough enough information from somebody who wants to remain completely anonymous and um, so what businesses will sometimes do is to try and um, unveil the the anonymity and ask the individual if they will disclose who they are um, but try and um, ensure that everything is dealt with confidential, confidentially. Um, it's probably a better approach. When when we talk about you know anonymity being lifted at at tribunal, um, I, I I'm I'm taking it that that then is in the realms of perhaps a a, a claimant who obviously isn't anonymous bringing a complaint, um, and individuals who are perhaps witnesses in in the realms of an investigation, um being be, you know being being deemed anonymous um from an employment law perspective if they are genuinely anonymous the employer won't be able to establish who they are um it's so i suppose there's a difference between anonymity and somebody uh requesting that their their identity isn't disclosed um and that that's a common issue in in the tribunal setting um that there'll be individuals whose identity is redacted during the course of an investigation, for example. And very often then the tribunal judge looking at the case will make a decision on whether they, they think that it's legitimate for that information to be um, out in, in the context of the tribunal claim at least, because to be able to cross-examine people and, and call witnesses, you need to know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and for that evidence to be tested, the claimant will need to know who they are. So again, depends on the factual scenario, uh, but completely anonymous people probably won't, we, won't, we will never know who they are. Um, individuals who request uh, for their names uh, to be kept confidential, yeah, very often that, that will come out during the course of a tribunal hearing. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the key mistakes that you have seen businesses make when dealing with whistleblowing issues? I suppose the main mistake that I've seen is, is uh, not acting quickly enough. Uh, so perhaps, um, you know, receiving the complaint, uh, but taking too long to, um, taking too long to action it. Um, taking too long to investigate um, and that's a common issue and if we think back to the uh, Tamara Brunkers case um, that we looked at at the very beginning of the session um, you know her complaints weren't weren't actioned um, so time is of the essence I think really when you're dealing with a whistleblowing complaint because you want to nip things in the bud and you want to make sure that um, things are dealt with promptly and, and efficiently. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. That uh, uh, Those are all the questions that have come in today, Ashling. So it just remains mm -hmm. for me really to, to thank you again for another excellent presentation. And there are certainly uh, lots of useful insights there from both the employer and employee viewpoint that I think we all need to take on board. Um, just thank you to everybody else joining us today for the session and a plug for our upcoming events. On the 4th of May, we have a webinar on sustainability with British Business Bank. The next one in our legal series is then on the 15th of May, which is charity funding cuts and insolvency. And then an in-person event, a uh, very special event with Neil Gibson is going to be a breakfast meeting here in our own premises in Lindenhall Street. And the title of that is Meeting Challenges and Maximising Opportunities. We do have limited capacity being the size of the lecture hall. So I'd encourage you to get on and book your place on that if you would like to come and hear what Neil has to say. So thank you again to everybody. And I just wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.